Welcome back to the Guardian with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for tuning in to this week's program. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Carol Conair is the 14th editor in the history of the Old Farmer's Almanac, founded in 1792, and the second woman to hold the title. In her role as editor, Carol oversees the development of the annual publication, working closely with the writers and other editors to develop new, useful, and entertaining matter. Welcome to the program, Carol. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me, Joey and Holly. It's so fun. Well, we appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule, not only to educate Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. And I'll start with this. While many people may be familiar with the Old Farmer's Almanac, there's a large uh, consensus that are aren't. Uh, can you explain to our listeners what the annual publication is? Absolutely. So back when everybody was a farmer, <laughs> you know, they needed another book in the house besides the Bible that told them, uh, you know, what the day of the week was, the seasons, marking the time. And also in the case of our almanac and why we believe it is so successful and it's the oldest continuously published periodical in North America is because of our, our long range weather forecasts. <laughs> you know, everybody who grows knows that the weather is the thing they, they need to know the most about, whether it's short range or if you could plan ahead, like a, you know, a magic eight ball, say. So um, our founder was an astronomer and he was the first person to really, um, I would say double down and think about sun science, um, combined with climate science and meteorology and, and make calculations that were fairly accurate about long-range weather. And what a boon to every grower. So th that's where we started. Um, and today, you know, it's kind of fun because we go back, we're, we're working on our 233rd issue. <laughs> uh, no pressure, right? And um, we go back and you can look at 1825 or 1925 and think about what is 100 years or 200 years done. And, you know, we're, we were doing stories about asparagus and backyard chickens and, you know, tomatoes in those days too. So much has changed. But even, you know, 50 years ago, 1975, a lot of our stories centered around things that you do, like canning and, and how to preserve your crop. Because that was when people started to really turn to the backyard to alleviate um, food bills. You know, 50 years ago, we had, we had a, an energy crisis. So it's fun to look back at those times, not fun to think about those hardships, but that people were really resourceful and that the Almanac responded and, and really kind of catered to the, to the beginner homesteader. Now, you mentioned one of the most notable things about the Old Farmer's Almanac is the very close or almost precise, accurate forecast that you guys are known for. Is that is is there a secret to that, or is it just knowing certain things about being in publication for two hundred years and looking at certain specific patterns when it comes to forecasting weather? Well, well, here's where you know information and data are are really upping the game, but also where weather patterns, as erratic as they are being, is also a, is is a challenge. Um, you know, today we use actually the same formulas that Robert B. Thomas used in 1792. And again, as I said, he was an astronomer. So he was really a pioneer in thinking about um, sun science. So, you know, the cycle of the sun, we're on, on sun cycle 25 since it's been recorded. And those are multi-year cycles. And we have seen a wild one, which may or may not have contributed, you know, to the hottest summer last year um and el nino this now so you know there's that's just one layer and so he he crunched data across sciences which was novel at the time but now we have a ton more data really according to those same formulas that we can look at however there is more aberration and the more data you have so our accuracy is really great, like 100% in some places. Last year, I think we had, oh, just for precipitation, um, we had a very, very, very good record. But temperature, you know, it was even hotter than we pre we predicted. So it really depends. And we work with um, so very scientists who work with our, our, our formula. 
that dates back to the very beginning. Wow, that's definitely very amazing. So there's a new guide, the Container Gardener's Handbook. It just came yes. out um, last month. It is quite comprehensive, very thorough. What can our listeners to expect when they pick up a copy? Um, when they pick up a copy copy of the Container Gardener's Handbook. Well, I don't know about you, but when I drive around, I see a lot of people putting all. I see raised beds everywhere and containers. People, you know, I think the pandemic really helped uh, people turn to the outdoors. So if you have a windowsill, great patio, great backyard. Maybe you're rethinking. I could do something more with this. So I see this wherever I go, and I think containers are just that. Uh, to me, it's just so accessible to everybody. So you pick up the book, and what you're going to get is a how-to from A to Z. You know, you're going to get the 36 most popular container plants and profiles on how to grow each one, and that includes some food and herbs too, um, not just you know flowers and other plants, but the idea of you know. Um, I think from the very beginning, thinking about the container itself is so important. So we all get marketed to like, this will be beautiful. And, you know, here's this ginormous plant um, that will make your life better. But can you move it? You know, right. <laughs> um, you can grow, grow pumpkins in five gallon containers, but can you carry them around? So maybe you would want to do a dwarf squash in a in a um, you know a material container or a fabric container, depending on your needs or accessibility. So to me, I think the container gardening handbook just puts growing anything kind of at hand or at your fingertips for anybody. So it's a great place to start. And then if you're kind of digging in deeper, you know, it's going to give you some other deeper knowledge like pests and diseases and really propagate, uh, you know, and share the bounty. So kind of like all those things. And it's interactive. You can actually write in this, like my container oh. veggies, the plant, when you planted it, observation notes. So you know what's going on. Cause we've all wrote this little, those little notes and we forgot where we put it or the notebook got, you know, wherever. So you have a, page you have pages in here where you can document what's going on good or bad i think that's why i, I like it it's it's like a, a very helpful compre like i said it's a comprehensive guide is it definitely is a handbook versus just like uh a, a, um i don't know what a, garden book. A, yeah, yeah, a garden yeah. book yeah i know you guys are great exactly we're telling you to write in the book it's so fun <laughs> it's like against the laws of books but that's really what you should do <laughs> Right, right. You know, that's why we provide the pages. And that's really from readers telling us, I need places to write stuff down. And we're like, okay, let's give you really good paper inside these pages right where you want them, you know? Now, you mentioned, you know, size of container because everything looks pretty. And then when you fill it up, it's 400 pounds. You can't move it. What <laughs> is some other tips to keep in mind for people who are not in the mindset like Holly and myself or you who do gardening year round or think about it 24-7? Exactly. Well, I think, you know, yes, thinking about the type of container, what does it weigh? What size do you need? We give all of those measurements for, you know, all the things you're probably going to want to try to grow. And I think that's really helpful because you can sort of just determine size. So thinking about that, okay, that's big, that's small, like what kind of then material will I want? And then we talk a lot about, you know, what's in the pot. And so it's like, what is the mix in there and what's right for those certain plants that you're trying to grow? You know, so many house plants, for instance, are really, we just borrowed them from tropical places and brought them into our homes in little miniature. So they require some other things. But um, yes, yeah, so I think it gives you a really um, <laughs> good idea about that. And then also the idea of um, a lot of people will do containers outside but they're not living like you're in Wisconsin. But, so you might need to bring a lot of things inside. So how many house guests really can you accommodate? <laughs> right. Uh, you know, and, and what kinds and what really will succeed or not? You know, I mean, many of us have tried to grow certain herbs over the winter and some just really aren't going to succeed without the light unless you really supplement the light, you know? So we talk about all those issues, um, so I think it just, again, like kind of makes it accessible, but uh, hopefully, you know, avoids pitfalls for people too. <laughs> right. And the internet is a fantastic piece of equipment, but also if you're searching for like in the back of the, the, the handbook, 
de- diseases and bugs. I've got this bug on this plant. Now I can go to the back of the book and identify it instantly and not have to search through a bunch of web pages to try to find does this, but what it kind of looks like this, you have it all listed in the back of the book very easily to uh, identify and then what to do about it or what the bug is. I can't tell you that's music to our ears because that's a tough section to put together and it takes a lot of time. And my fellow editors will be very happy to hear that that's useful because we feel like that's the, probably the outstanding part of the book is because when you need a quick reference, um, the, you know, the internet can kind of steer you down a rabbit hole when you're just like, I need to ID it. I want to know what to do. And so many of the solutions are simple and right at hand. Fantastic. So many people are told to put things like broken, hey. ter- broken terracotta, broken glass, sponges. Um, even sponges, <laughs> uh, rock, yeah. sand in the bottom of their containers for drainage. You know, yeah. what is, is this a myth? Is that necessary? Why? I love this question. So fun. Um, okay. Complicated, right? Uh, if you have a very tall, beautiful ceramic container that you bought and you don't want to put $25 bag dirt in there, you might want to put a filler because you don't need, the plant isn't going to ever grow that whole, that whole height. You know, um, so it really, again, depends on the situation, but I would not recommend putting anything heavy because we're already talking about things that tend to kind of be hard to move around. And I also feel like you can use much more organic material, whether you're growing something that you're planning to eat or not, you know, something like your egg cartons are pretty benign um, or, or, you know, cardboard that doesn't have any color or tape on it are things that you can put down there or just simply newspaper, newsprint, you know, (laughs) as it exists in your world these days. So yeah, I think it's, it's much more trying to think about what is that is going to contact whatever you're planting, eating, seeing, but you'd also do want to take into consideration what are the roots and the size of that planter. Right. I mean, you know, we, we tell people that the internet, there's some good stuff, but you, you got to filter out the good with the bad because there's some people out there, they're looking for clicks and they're looking for nickels every time you click, and they really don't care if they're telling you the right or wrong. As long as you're clicking on their stuff, that's really all they care about, and that gives a bad name to everybody else who's trying to provide good information and truthful information to those who have no clue what they're doing and want to learn. I know, that's really a good point that you bring up. It's it's worth digging in and looking at your source. Um, you know, I know that you've seen our, some of our, our products and we almanac.com is our website and people can find plant profiles there that are fact-checked and researched by farmers and growers from across North America. I mean, we really represent, I would say, all the zones in a way. You know, we're trying to think about everybody on our uh, in North America trying to grow. Fantastic. Well, you did just touch on our last question. We really enjoyed having you on the program. And again, if people want to find all of the great information for the Old Farmers Almanac and get the and book, all of, yeah, and get the book and, you know, all that great information, where do they go again? Well, almanac.com is a great place to go to buy any of our products, but also we are on newsstands. We're we're old fashioned in that way. You can find us also at a lot of lawn and garden stores. Like I don't know if you have Lowe's where you are or Tractor Supply. Um, and and Almanac.com in Canada also has our products. So an Amazon is also a place to find all of our books. The Container Gardener's Handbook is the third in our series, and then the fourth is going to be a house plants book. Well, Carol, we greatly appreciate the time you've offered and the education you provided, not only Holly and myself, but all of our information. And thank you for the, the effort that you've put forth to help all of us gardeners grow better each year. Thank you. It was a wonderful spending time with you.